it is a honor today to introduce Professor Atachi Mamoglu from the Institute of Quantum Electronics in ETH, Zurich. And he will take me just half of the colloquium to go through his honors, awards, and his CV. So I will not do that. And the other half to tell you his main achievements. So for the benefit, especially of the students that are sitting in the audience, just let me tell you that such research lies in between quantum optics and solid state physics with pivotal uh, achievement in quantum information theory, quantum electrodynamics, and uh, quantum optics. So, light matter interaction is at the core of his work, and um, with the possibility of using quantum optics techniques to study many body systems. Uh, so, today Atash is going to explain to us how to use quantum optics spectroscopical tools to probe and even uh, disclose, in some cases, uh, strongly correlated phases between electrons into the material. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you very much, Francesca, for very kind words. So, I, 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 I'm kind of loud, so I hope you can hear me. If not, let me know and I can put on the mic, uh, microphone. So, um, before I start, I'd like to uh, sort of thank my uh, co workers. I highlighted people who have contributed uh, a great deal to this work. I mean, Livio had carried out the, uh, together with Thomas the experiments. Ivan Moreira uh, did the uh, DMRG calculations, and you also had help uh, from. Um, with samples from the manuscript. Okay, so um, since this is uh, a colloquium, I will start out with some general comments uh, and uh, with apologies to the experts in, in, uh, in strong correlations in, in the audience. So basically what I'd like to remind you is that, that um, most of the materials that, that we deal with and we celebrate, uh, including many of those that, that we use in uh, photonics, are actually uh, describable using uh, a simple single particle picture. Okay, so this is true even if, let's say, we are dealing with uh, metals or semiconductors where uh, we, we have itinerant electrons. In many cases, the uh, lambda Fermi liquid theory allows us uh, to uh, arrive at an effective um, single particle distribution. And this, as I said, it covers most of the materials that that, that we know. Now, there's a smaller but, but very important uh, class of materials where this is not the case, where the strong electronic interactions play a crucial role in determining uh, the functionality. And this, uh, again, examples include ITC superconductivity or uh, various models for magnetism. Now, um, in contrast to the first class, the, uh, the materials with, uh, with these strong interactions are very difficult to analyze, and they, in many cases, exhibit unexpected uh, sort of properties or functionality, and that for, uh, to that uh, and one can consider fractionally charged particles as, um, as an example. Now, so strong correlations are good because it basically uh, allows us to have surprises, particularly those of us experimentalists, uh, when we uh, embark on a study of a material, we will be, uh, if we know what the outcome would be, then it would not be so motivating. Right? So, so one, one has some goals, but one, on the other hand, uh, it's all the better if the system that we're studying uh, sort of allows you uh, or open, leaves some open questions as to what we need. So, but if you want strong correlations where this, this would happen, so where do we start? Right? So, so the, basically, uh, when we can hope to get strong correlations is when we have uh, a system where a characteristic interaction energy scale, and we are considering now a charged particles, electrons, with a certain average separation uh, uh, R, and so, so the two energy scales that are relevant is the Coulomb repulsion between these two electrons, given by this expression, and the characteristic kinetic energy of the electrons that come uh, from uh, the fact that, that they are uh, fermionic particles and Pauli exclusion 
uh, uh, requires that, that we, we can put only one electron in, in any given quantum state. And what you will see then in 2D uh, that, that this guy scales as the electron density, whereas the interactions scale as the, um, as the square root of the electron density. Now, if you look at the ratio between the two, which is the so-called RS parameter, then we see that actually lower electron densities are favorable for enhancing the, uh, the, rate, uh, the scale of interactions as compared to the kinetic energy. Okay, so basically, as we reduce the electron density, the interactions become weaker, but the kinetic energy becomes even faster weaker. Then, and the net result is that uh, we go into a regime where the, uh, the physics, the uh, properties are dominated by, by interactions and which is, then lead to entanglement between uh, the electrons in this system. Okay. And this also uh, uh, sort of higher the effective mass, the, the higher this ratio RS parameter is, and the smaller the dielectric screening is, again, uh, the, um, the larger the RS parameter is. And of course, this actually doesn't mean that, that we just lower the electron density arbitrarily and then we will have strong correlations because there is always practically a limit coming from the disorder in the system. So since these energy scales are going down, what is not in this comparison is the disorder energy scale, some random potential. And we want to avoid this. So we want to avoid that the disorder uh, potential is the dominant energy scale. So one really seeks out a, 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 a sort of this um, uh, range of densities where the disorder is screened out and yet interactions are much more important than, uh, than the kinetic energy. Okay. So what happens then is that, that if the RS parameter is small, for example, this is the case in gallo marsonite where RS for typical densities is on the order of unity, then we have a Fermi liquid uh, and the electrons are basically randomly position except for the poly exclusion that, that they have to uh, pay attention to. Okay. If we can increase RS, for example, by lowering the electron density without uh, going into this disorder limitation, then it was predicted almost 90 years ago by Eugene Bigner that the electrons would actually spontaneously break translation symmetry and form uh, the so-called uh, Bigner crystal. Okay. And this requires that the RS parameter is larger than for, um, according to quantum Monte Carlo foundations. Now, uh, with uh, the advent of new materials, this has become possible. So with transition metal dichalcogenides, we as well as uh, another group have actually uh, shown signatures of Wigner crystallization or formation of Wigner crystallites at densities on the order of 10 to the 11 per square centimeter. Okay. But this is difficult, right? So getting to this regime where such uh, RS par parameter is very high requires very clean um, samples. And then you don't want to stop by seeing the big nucleus. So you want to see what happens as you melt this, uh, the, uh, the crystal, uh, because there are open questions there, not the temperature melting, but basically quantum melting by increasing the, uh, the electron density. Okay, so for to explore this, this kind of physics, it is desirable to have higher densities and therefore lower RS parameters uh, uh, where you can see strong correlations. And there are two ways to go about this. Uh, the first one is what actually the, uh, the community of scientists working with gallo marsonite have pursued, which is to apply a magnetic field that is perpendicular to the, to the plane. And what the magnetic field does is that even though the bands are very dispersive initially, you end up with flat Landau levels. And uh, once you confine all the electrons into the lowest Landau level, the kinetic energy is gone. There is no kinetic energy scale. And the dominant, uh, the only energy scale to deal with these interactions, and that's led to the discovery of fraction quantum ball effect, as well as the Wigner, uh, uh, observation of Wigner crystal back about 30 years ago. Now, another approach is instead of a magnetic field, although it can be combined with it, is to use a periodic potential and use this potential to generate uh, flat electronic bands in a uh, reduced Brillouin shape. Okay? 
And that, in a way, is uh, what uh, how strongly correlated uh, materials or, or uh, are can be understood. So, um, so I would say that actually at this point there are two uh, it's kind of established platforms for seeing strong correlations at low RS parameters. Okay. So the one of them is is for example cup rates, where one really is considering uh, let's say strongly bound electrons in a real lattice in a uh, in a, um, let's say, lattice of, of the, uh, the cuprate material. And uh, so the other one is as different as it can be from this material, which is uh, the case when you have an optical lattice confining atoms, okay? So in this case, again, uh, the, uh, the line scales are about the micron. Here it's uh, about two angstroms. The energy scales are as different as they can be. and. Uh, but in, in a way that, that similar correlation effects can be observed uh, in both systems. And actually, the initial motivation for these cold atom quantum simulators was to be able to understand the physics of, of cup rates or Fermi Hubbard model in general uh, by having a tunable system. Because what distinguishes also these two limits is that uh, conventional materials are hardly tunable. So if you want to change all doping, you have to make another uh, sample. You have to grow another sample, introduce different dopants. So it's a painstaking effort, at least from my perspective, to be able to fill up the, um, the, uh, the, the phase diagram that, that is shown. Whereas with cold atoms, you have full fun, uh, tunability. You can tune the potential. You can tune the interactions, etc. Okay. Um, in return, of course, uh, atoms have no functionality. We can think of them as kind of an analog computer that what our computers cannot do, this analog computer could do, that's at least the hope. Whereas, of course, the, uh, the interest in corporates arise from, partly at least, arise from their potential for applications uh, in, say, high PC supercomputers. Now, over the last five years, there is a new platform, if you will, that, that basically a new platform for exploring zone correlations that really, in so many senses of the word, lies in between the two. So these are the twisted Van der Waals materials that I'm going to tell you about. And uh, so here, the land scales are, again, right in between the two on the order of 10 nanometers. This is the, the lattice. Uh, uh, potential land scale, and the energies are on the order of 10 So one requires low temperatures, cryogenic temperatures, but not excessively so as, as you do in, in the case of cold atoms. And you can also uh, get a sizable degree of tunability in the system, uh, maybe not as much as, as cold atoms. So I, I will have a few comments at the end that it's, uh, it's changing. And there is also functionality, but only at the level features. Okay, so um, so why are we? Why am I excited about uh, this new platform as 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 an exciting direction for strong correlations? Well, basically, uh, these wonderful heterostructures actually do things that that you could only dream of in conventional semiconductors, where you're interested in bulk properties and proximity to surfaces kill the effect that, that you are typically after. Let's say if you want to have a C fractional quantum mole effect, you want to bury your quantum well uh, away from the surface such that you're not influenced by what happens at the surface due to the dangling bond stack that you have. Okay. So here, Everything, all the materials of interest in Van der Waals, that compose Van der Waals heterostructures, are basically monolayer or bilayer thick. And uh, so basically, we only have surface states, and each one of them have different electronic, optical, or magnetic properties. And what is remarkable is that in most cases, going down from a thick material down to monolayer. Not only preserves the functionality, but in some cases even improves it. And this is the case uh, for TNB, for example. So, and there are different classes. Again, uh, graphene is a semi metal, uh, TNBs, uh, transition metal dicarbonides are semiconductors, HPN uh, is, is, a, is one of the best insulators one can imagine with a band gap of about six electron volts. And what one can do, as, as um, the environment co-workers have uh, pictorially represented here, 
is that one can first exfoliate these uh, materials down to the monolayer level, make a library of sorts, and then come with this stamp and then pick up different uh, layers one by one and make a structure as, as the one shown here. And in this case, you can really combine functionalities such as you can pick up a superconducting layer and put a, say, a ferromagnetic layer on top mm -hmm. or a uh, semiconducting layer with spin orbit interaction, et cetera, et cetera. And in this way, you can get some of these uh, requisite uh, composite materials, for example, what, what one means for realizing model analysis. Okay. So that's the, uh, the TMDs. So uh, basically, when Andre Gahn and co-workers wrote this paper, the idea was that, that one can really put these materials on top uh, irrespective of their orientation, right? Uh, because in many cases, the, uh, the lattice uh, constant is rather different, so, so it doesn't really matter uh, how you put that. But if the lattice constants are similar or identical, then there is a new degree of freedom, and that is the twisting of the material. That is, instead of putting two materials that are identical right on top of each other, if one produces or introduces a finite angle, then the stacking of, of the atomic atoms in the two different layers have a periodic modulation in the sense that, that you know, at this side, for example, you have two uh, atoms of the same kind uh, sitting on top of each other, and that configuration is reproduced at a certain distance, which is the moire length scale. And, and this, uh, how far away these, uh, these scales are, sorry about that, um, is determined by the twist mm -hmm. length. So that's uh, then uh, how one can understand the formation of this new super lattice, which can be very uh, uniform and uh, not always, but can be, and, and gives you this, this new periodic landscape that, that could allow you to modify your band structure. Okay? So that's, um, that's the idea. And this was first demonstrated in this spectacular experiment by Pablo Javier Herrero at MIT. And then uh, this unleashed a, 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 a enormous activity of research. And this actually, in, in um, Pablo's case, this was twisted bilaterally. And this is probably the richest system there is in terms of how uh, to understand the properties of, uh, of, of, uh, of the electronic bands in the system. Uh -huh. uh, so um, another possibility, though, is that, that this is not restricted to graphene. One can also take transition metal dicarbogenides, which have actually, which are semiconducting, so they have dispersive bands. And one can also uh, either stack two of them that have a slightly different lattice constant, or if they have the same lattice constant, introduce a twist angle, and in this way, form uh, a, um, again, a moire band. And here I show a calculation of uh, balance bands, uh, moire bands, uh, and this is moly diselenide comes in by selenide. This is at two degrees. You see that, that there is a uh, relatively flat band with the bandwidth of 10 media electron volts isolated from the more dispersed. Okay. And what is nice in this system is that uh, there is no magic angle like you need in graphene. Uh, so all angles are in principle as good, and you can choose the twisting uh, angle as a tuning parameter of what your lattice periodicity would be, which in turn would determine how, uh, uh, how strong interactions would be as compared to, um, uh, to the hobbies. Okay. The drawback of these materials is that they're not as clean as graphene, so disorder is uh, displayed uh, in general more of a common material. And the other aspect is that, that the, uh, these are basically generically uh, potential seen by a monolayer. So it's a relatively uh, trivial triangular uh, band uh, for electrons that, that um, one can use as a starting point for observing correlate physics. Okay, so um, now uh, several experiments have already been done, uh, ranging from generalized weakness states to quantum anomalous solar effect, very recently reports of fractional churn insulator states. And, uh, but one question that has remained relatively open is, uh, is the quantum magnetism. That is, 
if we go to a more state or a more freedom state where the uh, the motion of degrees of freedom are frozen, uh, what happens uh, to the magnetic properties? What happens to the spin degrees of freedom? Uh, and and that is uh, that would be the topic that I want to uh, talk. Okay, so uh, maybe I stop here and see if you have any questions about this very long introduction. Um, um, Yes. Yes. Why is there no magic angle in the case of Yeah. So basically, uh, in the case of uh, graphene, and there are experts here that, that uh, can explain this much better than I do. But in the case of graphene, you start out with Dirac electrons, right? So the uh, so this is as far away as you can get from, in my opinion, from a flat band, right? So massless electrons. So what you uh, what happens is that when you uh, uh, place two layers and then when you uh, as they hybridize they open up a gap uh, and this gap essentially uh, um, uh, uh, the effect of this is to reduce the um, the direct velocity down to zero but this happens only at specific angles okay and only when the direct velocity goes to uh, zero or around that point you have these uh, flat bands right? but Generically, this doesn't happen because of, again, uh, as is schematically illustrated here, I mean, here you have a gap uh, between these two uh, due to the common coupling, but, but you, you preserve the, uh, the, the rack bones, and, and in that case, uh, you will not have isolated them. Now, this is not the case if you have uh, massive uh, parabolic bands. So when you have parabolic bands, all you do is you introduce a periodicity, which basically uh, we find some bands. Other questions? And everyone can hear me well. Good. Good. So uh, then uh, that brings me to uh, the outline. So this, uh, in the first part, I will tell you about uh, how we can use optics or excitons as a spectroscopy tool to study the ground state properties. And those of you at uh, Antonio's thesis depends actually have already seen uh, much of this. And, um, and in the second part, I will show you how we can use this spectroscopy tool to study uh, what we refer to as kinetic magnetism in uh, semi-combat environments. Okay. And uh, so let's move on. So a few more words about transition metal dihydrogenides. So uh, these are again uh, these layered materials that are semiconducting. So when I talk about the monolayer, this is actually a trilayer system, a triangular lattice of molybdenum sitting in between two uh, calcogen uh, triangular lattices. If you look at it from a distance, this looks like a uh, effectively a honeycomb lattice. But unlike graphene, the two sides have very different uh, atoms, right? So in this case, uh, A side, say, has a metal atom, and the B side has the two calcation atoms. And the bonds between uh, these atoms are covalent, very strong, have some iron character, um, uh, but the bonds between the layers is van der Waals, so it is uh, relatively easy to go down uh, to a monolayer by the usual exfoliation. And given this lattice structure, one would expect that, that again, the interest in physics, not necessarily, but could happen at the uh, high symmetry points, K and K prime of the Gluon zone. Um, and uh, and uh, this indeed is the case for monolayer uh, T and Ds. And that, that because of the, the fact that A and B sites are very different, this inversion symmetry is broken, uh, we expect a gapped material. And that's why we have. Uh, massive conduction and, and uh, gas and synthesis. Okay, so now, um, so whenever you have that, so this you can think of this as, as a conduction band, this as a balance band. So I want to describe in the simplest possible and not so accurate terms what excitons are. Okay, so um, and uh, so I go to an extreme limit. So what I'm going to describe is valid, if you will, for so called Frankel excitons, but hopefully it will. Uh, so sort of give kind of the right idea. So we start out with a system where chemical potential is in the gap, and we have a field balance band and an empty combustion. So this is our ground state. 
When we make an optical excitation, we take one of these electrons and put it into the uh, conduction band. And what happens now? So, so basically, uh, if this electron were to wander off uh, away from the hole that it left behind, then it will be subject to the strong Coulomb interactions with, with the electrons at those sites uh, in the semiconductor, right? Whereas if it sticks around uh, and so uh, binds to the hole that is left behind, then its energy would be smaller. And that's kind of the idea uh, of what an exciton is, that, that in the presence of strong interactions, the electron uh, can lower its energy by correlating its motion with the hole that it, it has left behind in the balance. Okay, so this is not a, uh, in what materials that we're interested in, this correlation doesn't exist at the, the underlying lattice line scale, but uh, basically the minimization of energy requires that there will be some finite extent of the electron hole wave function, and, and then that's what we describe as a one year. Okay, so that's, uh, but, but once this bound state is formed, then the, uh, this object can hop around uh, with minimal energy cost, and it will have a approximately parabolic bound for this stage. Okay, so that's, those are the kind of excitations we will be using. Okay, um, now, um, so in, in the uh, TMDs, transition method by charcogenites, basically, I already told you that, that the band structure is. Uh, like this, that we have a direct band gap in the K and minus K of the prime points of the blue line zone. And uh, so basically, the optical selection rules is that that, uh, that each value has a well defined, uh, uh, so it responds to right with the well defined polarization. This has to do with the circulation of the electrons being uh, opposite in these two values. Okay. And the main point is that. Uh, so if we extend the picture that I've shown you before, so instead of having band-to-band -band transitions, you will see when we sh shine light onto the system that there will be resonances below the quasi-particle gap. And these are the exitons, that is this bound state of the electron in the conduction band to the hole in the belts. And we can also now think of these as uh, basically superposition excitation of electron hole pairs over a finite momentum range uh, that allows to localize the electron and hole pair in a relatively small mass. And relatively small is really small in this uh, in these materials. So this is a nice uh, table uh, put together by Scott Cooper uh, uh, for different uh, semiconducting materials. The one that is of interest for us is molded by selenite. And the binding energy of the exciton is 230 meter electron volts. This is when it's encapsulated in HPN. Without the HPN, it is believed that it would be about 500 meter electron volts, but there's no measurement um, uh, of high magnetic fields that, that will allow you to determine this at least not easily. And the Bohr radius is 1.1 nanometers. So you can see that, that the electron and hole correlation is not at the underlying lattice length scale, that's about uh, 3.5 uh, nanometer uh, angstroms or so, but basically the electron and hole delocalize over, uh, let's say, 10 lattice sizes. Okay, so that's, um, that's uh, the, um, uh, the, the elements of, of spectroscopy. What is really nice is that, that uh, the excitons we can resonantly generate optically by photon absorption, but what we have generated by when we absorb photon is not a massless particle, it's actually a polarization wave which has a finite mass. Okay, so and it is and, and which actually consists of an electron hole pair. So it's a polarizable object. So it interacts with each other as well as with the electrons or the holes that you have in this. Okay, so that's uh, what we are going to use in, in spectro to do spectroscopy, that by converting an exciton into a, a quantum of polarization wave, uh, we can actually enhance the interaction uh, between uh, between uh, the optical excitation and the charging oh. So uh, I showed you this very small bow radius that it has several implications. 
And again, in the uh, context that uh, we are discussing, the most important one is that you know we will be considering electrons, I think electrons in the semiconductor, right? So we I told you about exit on the absence of electrons, but if I introduce electrons, provided that the Fermi wavelength is large compared to the size of the exciton, we can argue that, that the, uh, the exciton wave function would remain robust. That is, uh, the electron and hole with the, uh, in their almost 1s orbital uh, would hardly be in, uh, influenced or modified by uh, the presence of the electron. So the screening of the exciton is completely ineffective in the, uh, provided that the Fermi wavelength is much larger than, um, than the ball radius. And this uh, uh, actually, uh, the numbers that, that, um, that we can talk about are densities up to 10 to the 12, where we actually measure the, um, the oscillator strength of the exciton, which is determined by the ball radius squared to have remained within 90% of its uh, zero electron density. Um, the second uh, implication is that the exitons live very short because, again, uh, the lifetime of the radiated decay rate is proportional to the oscillator center inversely uh, is proportional to reciprocal ball radius squared, which means that, that the exitons we generate only live for a picosecond. So they have very little time uh, to probe what is uh, what is going on. All right, so um, it's also nice that that in some ways that, that these lifetimes are short because that brings the uh, the system a bit of an insensitivity to disorder. So so again, these materials are not perfect; they're uh, they're subject to disorder. Uh, but if the radiated decay is much faster than the decaying rate, then one can think of uh, basically, uh, like this, or at least I like to think of it like this. I introduce an exciton before it has time to scatter off the disorder potential, it recombines. And, and therefore, the effect of disorder on the line broadening uh, is suppressed. And indeed, actually, a good samples show exciton line broadening that is radiatively broken. Uh, and it, it, uh, an implication of that is that, that if you send light onto a material uh, at the exciton resonance, then it will act as an uh, atomic detail mirror. And what I mean by atomic detail mirror is that the reflection coefficient, specular reflection, uh, can be very high. So we see up to 70%, the highest value reported is 85%. So it's really um, kind of interesting that, that one can uh, realize. Uh, uh, such a linear optic platform. So it's still linear optics, but it's interesting. Um, now, uh, so when we do resonance spectroscopy, which is what I'm going to show, so we look at this reflection, and the fact that it's strong is good. And uh, if you design your material well, in the sense that, you know, we will not have just this monolayer, but we also have this encapsulating layers, HPN, and there are reflections from uh, the air, HPN interface, etc. So one basically uh, uh, sort of looks at a, a total reflection, and these reflections can interfere with each other. So if you make sure that the background reflection is zero, and if you're only looking at excitonic reflection, then as you tune your laser, through the exitonic resonance, your reflectivity could change dramatically. So uh, the highest value we saw is about 40, a uh, factor of 40 enhancement of, um, of reflectivity, right? So if background is, is zero, it can go as high as 10. But in practice, there's always some background reflectivity and the phases of the reflected light at different interfaces is different than the exitonic, uh, the light generated by the exciton. And that results in this funnel type uh, dispersive line shapes, which is uh, generic to, to most experiments. Okay. So, but this is then uh, sort of, let's say, the elementary signature we're looking at. We want to find out how strong these uh, optical resonances are and how they change in the presence of, uh, of say, electrons or other external conditions. Okay, so now uh, a optical picture of, 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 a, of the simplest device one can imagine. So this is essentially a monolayer uh, with 
top and bottom graphene gates. And so we also have a graphene layer to contact uh, the TMD. So TMD is, does not uh, sort of uh, has large short field barriers, so it's very difficult to do transports uh, with these size. But uh, if you have a graphene contact, you can actually use it uh, by changing the gate voltage to control the charging density. Okay. So, so the idea is that, that by using the top and bottom gates, if we increase these simultaneously, we keep zero electric fields, but change the chemical potential, move it from middle of the gap to convection band or balance band, et cetera, or we could actually cheat, apply different voltages to top and bottom gates and keep the chemical potential constant, but change the electric field seen by it. Okay, so now, uh, Let's look at this um, kind of old data. I think actually I'm going also to the data yesterday. Um, so basically, uh, this is the regime that, that I now only show. This is the, uh, the regime in which there are no charges. When the chemical potential of this uh, molybdenum biselenite layer is in between conduction and downs. And then as surrounded, the, the absorption or reflection is dominated by one peak. There are other 2s, 3s, exodons, et cetera, but that's off the scale here. So in the regime that, that I'm looking at, which is about 60 media electrons, there's only one resonance peak. It's a dispersive line shape, right? Because uh, we haven't really paid attention early on to eliminate the background reflection. The peak reflection is about uh, two or so. And, uh, and then you'll see that there is this very narrow line. So this, in this case, I think the line with this like 50 percent larger than the radiated line there. Okay, so this is the easy part. So you can uh, think of this as, as simple linear um, uh, physics. Then uh, what happens is that when you introduce electrons into the system by changing uh, the gate voltage, you see that the spectrum changes dramatically. And again, I'll totally explain this nicely yesterday, but if we uh, dwell on it, so if you take a line cut here, you see two things. Uh, first of all, some of the oscillator strength from this exit line is transferred uh, to the to a new resonance, and the exit line blue shifts and broadens, whereas as we increase the density, uh, the lower resonance picks up on oscillators. So how do we understand uh, what's going on here? So we can resort to a picture that, uh, if you're familiar with atomic physics, you might you would appreciate. So we can think about the problem of uh, sort of the modification of the spectrum as a scattering problem between an exciton and an electron. Okay, so let's assume that that's, uh, so uh, there, are, of course, this would depend on whether the electron and exciton occupy the same value or opposite values. So let me just focus on, on uh, the, uh, the opposite value case. I won't go into detail why there is no bound state in the other one, but in this case, the potential is that of, of a, a neutral but polarizable particle and, and then uh, and a charged particle. Right? So the interaction between the two at long distances is one over r to the four. And uh, this, of course, uh, sort of uh, rolls up and, and uh, uh, sort of the um, approach at, at very short uh, length here is for the so such a potential in this case supports a bound state. Turns out that it's it's a single bound state, and that is what we refer to as the triangle. So it's a bound state of an electron and an exciton. Okay. So now, if you consider uh, a scattering state, a low energy exciton and electron approaching each other, the effect of of this um, of this uh, bound state is that that the scattering state will hybridize with the bound state. So as the electron and exciton distance go, uh, gets smaller, they see the possibility to form a trion. It's off resonance, so they cannot occupy a trion state, but they, they will hybridize with it. And as a result of hybridization, the energy of the, the scattering state will go up. And uh, so that is, and effectively the positive interaction. So the presence of this bound state means that the energy of the, uh, of the scattering state is going to be higher. And the closer this state is, the larger this energy shift is going to be, right? Because then the energy penalty for virtually 
occupying or mixing with the molecular state is going to be this. Now, at the same time, this molecular state, which is optically non-observable, it doesn't have a nosotus, right? It, because of the hybridization, it picks up an exciton character. It picks up the scattering state character, which actually is optically accessible. That's, uh, that's our exciton polarization wave that we generate. So the net result is that this molecular state is going to redshift while picking up an osteoporosis. Okay. So therefore, the two resonances that, that we have seen in, are these two states. So this is the scattering state that is blue shifting, seeing an effective repulsive interaction due to its hybridization with the molecular state and the triumph state. And this is the, uh, the lower branch, which starts out as a molecular state and hybridizes picks up an osteoporosis. Okay. So this is what we describe as an attractive polon. This is the repulsive polon. And, and the reason for that is we can think of these excitations as exciton distorting the Fermi C in which it is embedded in one case, uh, the, uh, it tries to extract an electron from it. And in the other case, it repels uh, the electrons um, to form the repository. And what is important is that the oscillator strength of this branch for low densities is given by the exciton oscillator strength times this quantity, which is the Fermi uh, momentum times the size of the, the molecular state to the power. Okay? And this naturally is proportional to the electron density. But if I'm considering an exciton in K value, it's proportional to the electron density in the other value. Okay? And there is no bound state for electron and exciton in the same value, and therefore there is no such resonance. Uh, that occurs if they are in the same value. And I will try to show you with uh, these experiments that are taken at 14 or 16 Tesla. So basically, as you go to uh, 14 Tesla, yes, uh, what happens is that, that the valley Zeeman effect is large enough that, that you have a finite electron density. All the electrons occupy one value, right? Because uh, it's energetically not favorable uh, to occupy states of the opposite value. Of course, this is a misleading picture, so we no longer have parabolic bands. We have multiple Landau levels that, that we are occupying, but um, which you see, which you see here, but, but I won't go into that. Um, so basically, we, we, we go to a scenario where electrons are all in, say, in minus k value. So if I now generate an exiton in k plus value, then just as advertised, I see this feature where I, I have the repulsive problem and the attractive problem showing up um, at low energies. But if I, by using sigma minus polarized light, if I generate my exiton in the same value as the electrons, then I see this blue shift of the exiton, but there is no attractive problem resonance mm -hmm. um, uh, associated with it. Okay, so this is. Very nice, actually, uh, for our purposes, if you want to study magnetization, because in this trivially magnetized case, you see that, that if I place all my electrons into this spin down state, so this is valley, spin down the walk state. Um, so if the electrons are all here, I can tell you that by just looking at the optical response. Right? When I see that, that I only see the attractive problem in sigma plus, I can tell you that all the electrons are in the opposite value. Okay. But it doesn't have to be a yes and no answer. I can also do the experiment at a lower field. And then I will see a chapter following in both that um, uh, polarization because I do have now some population in both values. But the uh, the strength of the uh, of these guys and uh, give me directly uh, the density of electrons in uh, in the opposite value. And, and from this uh, difference uh, of, um, between the strength, I can actually determine the magnetization of the system. Okay, And that's what we're going to use. We can use the, um, the, the, uh, this optical uh, spectroscopy signature uh, to determine the spin polarization. Okay, so um, any questions? Yes. <laughs> okay, that's good. That I, yes. So all you just uh, showed was for uh, putting electrons up in the uh, 
And uh, I, I don't know about the material, but like, is it kind of SP character? Um, no, all the tools. Like, is it like a S symmetric of PMP, symmetric down the holes? Um, no, it's not like that. So actually, the orbitals are predominantly D orbitals oh. uh, of the transition method. So the conduction band is uh, something like 90, 95% dz square orbital. And the balance band is uh, D, uh, dxy plus or minus i dx square minus y square. They do hybridize with uh, with the calcogen p orbitals, but this was actually I still find it very surprising that that uh, at the um, the k and k prime value this hybridization is relatively weak. So up like ten percent for balance band, five percent for conduction band. So, so my my question is, if you go down to a key, do you then see different types of ions emerging because the holes have different bands? Yeah, so uh, no, this this is not uh, directly uh, related to that. So so basically, the actual electronic bands uh, do not, as far as I, I can see, do not play a, a substantial role in the formation. So what, what determines whether there is a bound state, a triangle state or not, is whether the electrons can actually form a symmetric state, because only if they form a symmetric orbital state, they can maximize their attraction uh, to the uh, positively charged ball. Right? So that's why in the uh, when the electron and exciton are in the same value, the electron that is down to the hole, as well as the icing the electron, they have the same quantum numbers. So they have to have an uh, anti-symmetric orbital wave function. And that actually, uh, in, for most mass ratios, which are relevant here, they do not allow for a bound state. It's not a general statement. That actually, that's what Antonio looked at. If the electrons were lighter, then this would have been possible. Okay. I have a question. Why do you apply a magnetic filter and you start with a sample? In that case, you have number layers. Yes. You apply a magnetic filter in plane. You have no number. That's correct. Um, you have the same uh, yeah, but so that's that's the important point here that that uh, when I apply an in-plane uh, magnetic field, uh, at least reasonable magnetic fields, and I even consider 16 tests are reasonable, nothing really interesting happens. And the reason for that is something I uh, uh, sort of uh, kind of skip. That, that um, there is in these K and K prime uh, values, there's very strong spin orbit interaction. So basically, uh, the spin and value are strongly correlated. So when I talk about K value electrons, these are spin up. The spin down band is about 20, 30 million electron volts above. And the opposite is true for the K minus K value. So, of course, in the absence of magnetic field, you have previous degeneracy, but uh, the spins uh, associated with the two values are, are different. And the applied in-plane fields uh, uh, cannot mix these states with very different momentum, very different circulation. Um, so they will try to mix the uh, spin states, which are split by spin orbit interaction. So you need the magnetic field, in-plane magnetic field, larger than the spin orbit splitting, and that's not accessible. So that's why we end up applying only um, out of plane magnetic fields. So, um, yeah, but there are lambda levels, but as I said, that, that's actually uh, the effect of the lambda levels is also what we discussed yesterday, is relatively <coughs> minor. So you can see these cusps. Actually, this goes up to five or so, we can see that. So this is mu plus one, mu plus two, etc. So whenever the electrons are in an incompressible state, their ability to broaden uh, and shift the, um, the excitonic states is partially compromised. It's only very little, right? Because these gaps are only two milli electron volts, whereas the relevant energy scale in the system is the triangle energy. So, so there is an effect, but it's a small effect that, that, um, that has to do with the round out quantization. Okay. Oh, oh, yeah. Why 
I remember if I do not and I do, you can do show the opportunity sense and I did some of the things for the country, the interest banking for the first time. Yeah, so no, because again, Yalu Mars and I parameters are very, very different. I mean, particularly if you go to high fields, so um, you know, the uh, the effect of Light mass has two uh, consequences, right? A, uh, that the, uh, the interaction scales are, are smaller. B, that, that the uh, cyclosome energy is uh, more than an order of magnitude higher than, than what you get here, which means that the interaction scales become smaller than the lambda level spacing. Here, the physics is very, very different. So, uh, you know, there again at 10 Tesla, I would have a cyclotron energy of maybe 15 media electron volts and a Coulomb energy of say five to 10 media electron volts. Here, Coulomb energy is 230 media electron volts, cyclotron is two media electron So you cannot describe the physics of excitons or of triumphs or polarons by only considering uh, single lambda levels. So that's uh, that's the, um, I, I mean, in Galois and also this is not uh, uh, not always uh, the case. So if you go to Holmes or to um, in our aluminum mass, like Mansur Shagan has this experiment to X Valley, then you can actually get very large RS parameters. And in, and then if you apply a magnetic field, you actually see that that uh, the um, uh, you can see the inner crystal, etc., where many lambda levels function. So. There was another question or uh, good. Okay, then I I move along. So um, who I I ran out of time. So I I will uh, show you um, then rather quickly this uh, the real part. So this is now it's a more complicated system where uh, I uh, consider a bilayer. So I do not introduce a twist angle because these two guys have about a lattice mismatch of four nanometers. So therefore, if I consider, let's say, the regime where, say, the tungsten atom, molybdenum mm -hmm. atom sits on top of tungsten atoms, so called NM site. So uh, because of the lattice mismatch, this these sites would reproduce themselves every eight nanometers or so. Okay, even if I do not have a twist angle, if I introduce a twist angle, I can change that, make it smaller. So, but I have this more lattice uh, irrespective of, of, uh, of the angle, okay? And uh, what is special about this, uh, this more system is that uh, it has a type one band alignment. So there are only two that I know of which has this, that is uh, basically the minimum of conduction bands and the ma maximum of balance band are, are in the same material. There's a potential, but the, uh, the, the um, let's say the conduction and down strands haven't moved spatially uh, to minimize that. Okay, so uh, what happens now because of this this periodic potential? I've already told you that that you uh, expect uh, to see uh, sort of a reduced periodic zone with flatter bands. And how flat these bands are depends on the details. So so this is a calculation from Yang Zhang. For this material system, blue is for the conduction band. You see that, that it has very nice deep uh, potential wells for electrons that, that describe the slowest energy conduction more mm -hmm. And the orange one describes actually, sorry for the uh, the color coding here, that it actually describes the whole band. So they're a lot more dispersive. So this is the real space, right? So the fact that, that the variation in real space means small means that, that in momentum space, the bands will be a lot more dispersed. And the similar uh, uh, calculations that you also hold for tungsten bands. So these are also, even though I call them flat, they're not as flat as the moly bands. Okay? So let's keep this in mind. And the point is that, that this minimum is at an end site, so where tungsten and moly are sitting on top of each other, and these sites form this triangular lattice where as we put electrons, we expect the electrons to start occupying these sites. I will have a cartoon for this. So um, this is just a more general comment about how we can study these uh, more systems. So the most visually appealing one is either STM or case or response force microscope, where you have the spatial resolution to see uh, the sites where the electrons are. 
Uh, and this can actually differ a lot based on whether you have a transport is difficult to discuss optical spectroscopy. And um, so let me move on. So, so now again, I, I do the same trick. So I, I first show you, okay. I first show you uh, the regime when the, uh, the chemical potential is in the gap. Now, the main difference is that instead of having just one exciton resonance, I have several. Okay, and this is due to the fact that the excitons now see a, an effective center of mass potential because the conduction and the unspent potentials are different. Uh, the exciton that forms out of the electron hole pair actually is subject to a potential and that results in new exciton events. Okay, so when I introduce electrons, sorry, I don't know why I'm getting panicked by this. So when I introduce electrons, then uh, the spectrum changes dramatically. And I must say up front that I do not understand uh, uh, many of the features here, but I do understand what happens here. This is the attractive polon resonance, the one associated with the molecular state. So as I introduce electrons, I put electrons into these, uh, these MM sites. So this is when uh, the Healing is less than one, I would expect these electrons to hop around using the empty sites. Uh, when I have a unity filling, then I would expect this to become incompressible uh, because of the fact that it's energetically forbidden to double, double occupy the site. And if I put more electrons, then I will have doublons, which can again become um, uh, mobile. Okay, so now. This is, uh, let's say, looking at the spectrum, how it appears redshifted, this would be a good candidate for uh, the counterpart of monolayer to track the polar resonance. And this is another device showing similar features. And regarding this incompressibility and similarity to the uh, integer uh, quantum mode effect, you see that, that this resonance at nucleus two and three exhibit these costs and, and this is actually also seen in other material systems is this relatively weak signature of incompressibility of electrons on the exciton spectrum. Okay. But that's not what we are looking at. What we want to see is how this uh, attractive polon resonance changes with magnetic field. That will tell us if it is a true attractive polon resonance. So it's exciton resonance, if I apply a magnetic field, it should just split and uh, and by a G factor of polarity. So let's see what happens as I turn on the magnetic field. You see that that indeed that the excitonic resonances are basically hard to see even how much they have shift, shifted. But you see that that this resonance now has lost its weight in sigma minus and it's almost predominant in sigma plus. So that basically tells us that that this is an attractive polar resonance. So it will. Uh, we can use this resonance and the ratio of the population to determine the screen policy. Um, and this is uh, how the oscillator strength of, of this resonance uh, behaves. So it increases until I reach equals one and then goes down to zero. So how do I understand this? So this, uh, the transitions that lead to this attractive polarum are associated with basically exciting an electron from the valence band to this uh, sort of um, state of the sites that, are, uh, that form this flat band. And if I doubly occupy each site, I cannot form these excitations. And that's why the oscillator strength is going to work. So that basically is a strong indication, I'm not able to say proof, that, that the physics of the nucleus 2 is describable by a single band power point. Right, so I start occupying uh, sites, and this is at a uh, large magnetic field. So basically, uh, this is the light in this depolarization effect. So basically, the, uh, the oscillator strength of uh, one polarization remains zero because I cannot make any citation uh, of the same spin. The other guy picks up and then goes down because the states are no longer there. Okay, so. Um, it up. So this is then the how the uh, sigma plus sigma minus oscillator strengths evolve, and um, from these we can determine uh, the uh, the mag we use the magnetization at various temperatures to determine and and take this way uh, to the to determine a uh, Curie-Weiss temperature to 
get an idea about when we can expect to see interesting magnetic phenomena. And what we see is that that you know pretty wise temperature is positive at, at the dominant side when we are we have more than one electron per side. It's negative on the cold orbit side, and it's about zero at the nucleus one, where you normally discuss the interesting magnetic properties today. Right? So it's triangular lattice. Uh, you would expect super exchange to dominate, and then you expect to have new order, um, with, which should show up as some negative uh, field wise temperature. Well, you see that, that it's essentially zero. Um, we check another device. It's again qualitatively similar here. The anti-ethanolmagnetic correlations were weaker. And this actually, if you look at literature, such a um, Dependence is reproduced by uh, by other groups as I'll say the Cornell group of uh, ING. So uh, initially, so we, we try to explain this so, so we can put in numbers, right? So this is a system with very deep wells, which actually results in extremely strong Coulomb interactions. Actually, if you take the um, the calculated uh, one year orbital size, uh, size, this actually is more than 100 in the electron. So I think maybe uh, was more conservative here. But what this all says is that super exchange is vanishing this small unless you go to really low temperature. So in that sense, at nucleus one, the, the fact that magnetic properties are not terribly interesting, at least at the temperatures we can reach, uh, are, are kind of uh, understandable. Now, if you have uh, go to new larger than one, Things can change because what now determines the low energy physics is that you have these doublons, and what is the uh, configuration that maximizes the delocalization of the doublons that that would minimize the kinetic energy associated with the doublons? And Nagoka about 50 years ago uh, showed that actually in such a case um, that that uh, a ferromagnetic orientation would ensure constructive interference in, in hopping and would lead to a minimization of the kinetic energy. And in this case, then, uh, the characteristic energy scale that would determine the magnetization or magnetic properties is given by T, not by uh, T squared over V. So even in, so in systems where on-site repulsion is very strong, you would expect that, that this could actually be dominant. Okay. Now, how about the, uh, the new uh, smaller than one case? And here, actually, the physics is more interesting. I will not dwell too much on it because um, massive so far is not that uh, easy. My friend is not very positive. Yet. But uh, so basically, uh, this was analyzed by Herter and Shastri in 2005 or so. So the physics here is a bit different. Uh, so basically, this is a triangular lattice with kinetic frustration. So what that means is that, that, say, if you have spin polarized electrons, uh, then the hopping experiences a destructive interference because of the negative sign of the hopping. Okay? So this can be avoided. The destructive interference can be avoided if one, uh, if each hole actually has an associated uh, spin field. So I'm not talking about the ground state now, but if I apply a finite magnetic field, how would the magnetization be? And this really suggests that, that the system would act as if it prefers an anti ferromagnetic state, and there would be an uh, obstruction of full polarization. Okay? So, um, and uh, so this, these are the results that Ivan did for using the MRG with only on site, very strong on site repulsion, and indeed it uh, seems to reproduce qualitatively. Uh, the features that he has. But there was in the details. So when we did the measurements at very low temperatures, at very, very low powers, down to picowatts uh, per micron squared. Um, so this is like one photon arrives every 100 nanoseconds. On, uh, so mm -hmm. very, very low. What we see is that actually magnetization uh, measured through attractive form resonances as a function of magnetic field is identical for uh, nucleus 0.8 and 1. And so basically, uh, the system uh, doesn't seem to uh, want to go anti ferromagnetic at all. And so, one explanation that, that we then found is that this might be a consequence of the long range Coulomb interactions 
uh, acting together with disorder. And this is a DMRG calculation showing how the expected magnetization can become very paramagnetic like in the presence of uh, long range interactions. Okay, so uh, for mu larger than one, uh, the magnetization does uh, pick up as shown here. And when we plot the overall spin susceptibility, so this is the main result, so I'm just standing this way and here. So you can look at uh, the normalized phase in mu plus one. You see that below mu plus one, it's a paramagnetic response, and then there's an abrupt jump in spin susceptibility. Uh, indicating that that's we're dealing with um, uh, the Nagorka uh, kinetic matrices. Okay, so I, um, I will just skip this. Uh, I want to show, I uh, end with the comparison to a, a concurrent experiment from Marcus Reiner's book uh, using cold atoms in square and triangular lattice. Mm -hmm. So in the square lattice, what they see is that, that there is super exchange dominated and magnetic correlation. This actually uh, recovers uh, towards a ferromagnetic correlation due to Nadolka acting on both sides. And for triangular lattice, they see that, that they can get to ferromagnetic on, on uh, basically doubles of the particle both sides, but there's a pronounced uh, sort of anti ferromagnetic <laughs> correlation for both. So it's very different, right? So uh, even though uh, on paper, the, the systems are similar, triangular Fermi Hubbard model. Uh, but what uh, the, the more positive note I would make is that, you know, here we're dealing with a much more complex system. So this, uh, this experiment was, in a way, designed to agree with the theoretical predictions. Right? So uh, it, the interactions were set, etc. cetera. Uh, uh, whereas here, we only can control so much. And indeed, we think that, that we are limited by. Uh, or the physics is drastically modified by the uh, long range code. Okay, so I will uh, just show this and, and stop here. Thank you. Well, many, many thanks for making this chapter to explain to us such a yeah, complicated and interesting way to see a strongly correlated flow. Questions. Yeah, uh, your work with the pure cover model uh, is also for a system when you project the bio uh, result of the problem, you also have some interside exchange, ferromagnetic exchange. So, how do you know that uh, what you have is? Now that ferromagnet is associated to the pure color model and not uh, coming from an extra interaction. Question. Yes. So, um, so basically, this is one of the things that you do not understand. So, what I would say is that indeed, if you look at Alan McDonald's calculations for the parameter regimes that, that we are dealing with, the direct exchange should dominate over super exchange. So, I Told you kind of a historical uh, sort of story that that you know we were expecting uh, super exchange to be dominant, but for these parameter regimes, uh, he calculates that that the direct exchange is the dominant one. So the answer to your question again is that that you know if it was really a direct exchange effect, I do not see why the nucleus one should not show paramagnetism. I mean, actually, what Alan analyzed is nucleus one. The, the mod state in the, in the triangular lattice. And what he's saying is that for such interaction land scales and for uh, the potentials that, that we have, one should have a ferromagnetic ground state and uh, at mu plus one. So, uh, so what we believe that that's the, it's a kinetic mechanism because of this abrupt jump in, uh, in the uh, spin susceptibility as soon as we go above mu plus one. Right, so uh, direct exchange should not be influenced uh, by by the presence of, of a minute but finite number of doublons in this would be my uh, my answer. But you're not convinced. Fine. <laughs>
But the, the, I mean, the point is that that why is there uh, why is mucus one not ferromagnetic, uh, not anti-ferromagnetic? One, one, it's also not ferromagnetic. We don't have an answer. Well, it's, uh, power one, and the ferromagnetic will be stronger than they can't compensate partially. I don't know. So I, 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 yeah. I, I don't know. I just ask you to say, I don't know. Okay. So thank you very much for this nice. It's very nice to talk to Mr. Magnetization. I have two questions. Can you, usually in a family, if you have the reason they should compare to making parts of the species of the Is there something similar here? Um, so, I would expect so, but, but I, it's very difficult for us to say anything because we don't exactly know what the effective mass is. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, so my guess is, is this, that, that you know, uh, so let's say, for example, for the Dublin side. Uh, so basically, A, I mean, what our uh, more potential is, how much I can trust the uh, DFT, this I do not know. And on top of it, that, that what we need to do at Dublin side is that, that this potential is modified due to heart rate and potentially fog contribution. So it's no longer as, uh, as flat as it, it was for low doping. And that would change the effective mass, how it does, and what it happens to this. I don't. Okay, thank you. Maybe one short bit. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe it's naive, but you don't seem to consider the conductor. Yeah, so uh, in principle, I mean, this was one of the motivations for this particular uh, Noiré system, where even though it's direct band gap, uh, there is evidence that, that the tungsten bands are not so far away. So by applying an electric field, it is possible to make sure that, that the electrons actually, even uh, before the equals two, can go to the tungsten band. But the ideal scenario uh, is that, that uh, would be that, that if you tune it further out, and this doesn't seem to be possible, that is after you have new plus one, right? After you fill this uh, deep moiré potential with one electron, then uh, due to the uh, heart rate moiré effect, the, the fact that the band is now a lot more dispersive, and you broke down the, uh, uh, the tungsten band closer in energy, that, that you could actually put electrons into the dispersive tungsten band, and then you have the, uh, the condo lattice model. It didn't work. So it seems like it's working in another material system, which is very rich, the molybdenum dicarbonate tungsten diselenite. So there, actually, uh, again, this, this band tuning um, leads to two very interesting effects. One of them is in one regime that that's, you know, when the energy difference is sizable, but finite, you can indeed have itinerant electrons in very dispersive tungsten bands, and they're indications of uh, uh, heavy thermal physics. And when they bring it together, then actually the bands hybridize, and you obtain churn bands. And this is, uh, they, in this system, they only saw um, a quantum anomalous solar effect, uh, very nicely though. And they, uh, there's another system where uh, there are recent reports of this fractional churn source. So, so it's rich. I mean, the um, the material systems at hand are finite. You know that that after all, there are uh, uh, a total of twelve, uh, um, twelve six um, uh, combinations that are easy to handle, but um, still interesting. More questions, especially for students. I saw that you're sitting on this part. Do you want to ask? So maybe Forget you could get seven. another credit for asking that questions. Not, <laughs> you have some fundamental things you like to ask. Some more questions from anyone? Well, um, are there any conclusions now for the magnetism and the graphene or just the binary graphene from your work? Or is it really just a different? I think that, that, you know, uh, I could tell you more about this. I mean, this is a uh, twisted binary graphene is, is, uh, is much richer, and I don't know so much about it. But I, I mean, there again, uh, the magnetic state appears uh, very clearly at nucleus 3. There might apparently there are other results, but 
and that's due to uh, the, the formation of the churning structure. So similarly, in these material systems, so uh, if you uh, have a churn insulator state, then it's ferromagnetic. So uh, that has been seen, and it, the hysteresis uh, behavior in, in magnetization. But uh, in these uh, sort of topologically trivial systems, um, it's it's a different um, different lattice, different uh, system. So I'm not sure what it can tell one about, uh, you about uh, the magnetic properties of this So do we expect this magnetic to be ferromagnetic to survive everything? Or no, I mean I in, I, in... I I no, <laughs> but yeah. So I have one very quick naive question. I mean, is it always true that accidents are good spin sensors in the sense that what about the polarization in this kind of mechanics? And the second is about one and a half. Yeah. So uh, yeah, half. it actually yes, very good question. I mean, what happens around here is that um is that the uh, indeed the excitons uh, uh, destroy the magnetic state? That's at least what we believe is happening because we can see that this depolarization effect associated with light sensitivity uh, is uh, is very different depending on light intensity. So I showed this data. Uh, I didn't have time to explain this to you. Right? Uh, so this high temperature data uh, that basically got us excited about anti ferromagnetic correlations. So this one is a pure exciton-induced spin depolarization. Mm -hmm. So uh, so what really woke us up is that, that you know, we wanted to check how robust this is for light-induced uh, effects, because we've seen light-induced uh, spin depolarization before in monoways. So this was taken at about 10 nanowatts. Mm -hmm. So we have to decrease the power by more than three orders of magnitude to get rid of this effect. But at the very low filling factors, even picowatts is, is not down there. But, but you can clearly see that low power uh, sort of fixes for more. And you know, the picture there is this, uh, again, it's a hand wavy argument, but at very low filling factors, you have these isolated electrons in these deep blocks. This is like, a these are like uncorrelated quantum blocks, right? So, uh, and when you uh, find a way to flip the spin of an electron, to, uh, to a higher energy state, mm -hmm. and these energy level spacings are very, very small, um, then the relaxation can take, take seconds. You know, that, that's calculated in quantum dots, you know, what is the T1 time of, of, of a an electron spin? This can be seconds long. So, um, so that's why even, let's say, one out of thousand excitons uh, end up flipping the electron spin. Mm -hmm. Uh, a very weak process, but but it can have a long lasting effect. So so that's of course uh, a limitation, a strong limitation. Good. Thank you so much. There are more questions. You come almost to us. If not, let's thank Natasha.